Blue Haven Initiative is an innovative family office dedicated to putting wealth to work for competitive returns and positive social and environmental change. And it's a pleasure to have with us the co-founders of Blue Haven, Liesl Pritzker Simmons and Ian Simmons. Welcome to the Business of Giving, Liesl and Ian. Good Thank to be you. here. Let's start by talking about your journey. What first got each of you interested in impact investing? Starting with you, Liesl. Sure. So I got interested in impact investing because I have a portfolio to manage. I'm a third generation of the Pritzker family. So we're a family that has a lot of different businesses and I am lucky enough to be an inheritor of some of the fruits of that labor. I was 21 years old when I got control over this portfolio and long story short, here we are 15 years later. And now the family office that I've set up with Ian in the meantime, Blue Haven Initiative is one of the first single family offices that is 100% dedicated to impact investing. So that's how I got the actual assets to invest. But what really got me interested in this space was I'm a steward of these assets. I'm next generation. I didn't make them myself. So I feel maybe a little bit of extra pressure to make sure that I know exactly what I'm invested in. I know what it's doing in the world and it's doing things that I think my family would be proud of. And so that's the work of Blue Haven and that's the work of our portfolio. We look across asset classes. We look across different industries and sectors and different fund strategies and also direct investments into companies. But we want to make sure that everything is having some kind of social and environmental positive impact alongside its expected financial return. How about you, Ian? Well, my family's been involved in what we now call impact investing for many generations as entrepreneurs, as executives, as professionals, as philanthropists, as investors. And then also when it came time for me to steward assets that I inherited, I was also interested in deploying those assets into solutions and doing impact investing. So I really grew up around examples of successes in impact investing and knew that there was a better way to invest. Lisa, how has your view of returns evolved since recasting your portfolio for impact? Well, I, th I think that's a good question. One of the things also, even to your first one around what really drew me to impact investing is I think that businesses and markets when used for the right things can be incredible at scaling impact. They can be very good at that. The innovation economy, deploying climate change solutions, things like that. Actually, markets can be really good at scaling. There are some things, however, that they're not so great at scaling. <laughs> and I think equitable access to excellent education, for example, markets have really, really struggled at. Maybe they shouldn't have a place in there at all. So I think my idea of financial return and impact return has just become more complex as we've started to look as investors across the total package of tools that we have available. Sometimes things don't make sense if you're expecting a venture-like return. Sometimes things are going to be really risky, but have an infrastructure-like return. So that's okay. Maybe we'll use our philanthropic portfolio to do some of that investing as well. We just try to think creatively about what is the problem? Is it a market problem or does it have a market solution? Uh -huh. And if so, then let's look over on the investment side. If not, maybe it's a philanthropic play, maybe it's a policy play, but we are lucky enough to have all of those sorts of tools to work with. So let's use the right one for the right job. You have been at this long enough, Liesl, to see the field evolve. Are we getting better at measuring social impact? I think so. I would say yes. There are some exciting, there's measuring outputs and outcomes, which are a little bit harder, but we get a lot of help from the incredible work of development economics. So much so actually three development economists who really brought kind of randomized control trials into the impact space, won the Nobel Prize last year for economics. So we're starting to really see that getting adopted. More people really getting good on yeah. what happened and why it happened. So I think investors are learning from that space and trying to say, okay, if we know that this intervention has this kind of outcome, how do we maybe create a business that can help to scale that? 
without having to retest it every single time. So I think we are getting better at that. We're also getting better on the flip side, on the public market side, at looking at what kinds of ESG or environmental social governance criteria are actually material to financial performance. And there's a wonderful professor at, at Harvard Business School who does a lot of work on this, George Serafim, at which kinds of disclosure and levers around ESG actually lead to outperformance of share price financially. So we are getting better at it, but there's still a ways to go. Disclosure and data collection is very noisy, um, and to say the least, but as more money is crowding into the space, we're starting to, I think, differentiate it a little bit more. Ian, as Lisa was referencing, there are some domains where market investments are the most effective and others where philanthropy does the best job. But there are still others where policy change is the place to spend your time and energy. What would some of those areas be? A good example is putting a price on carbon where it takes setting the rules of the market to determine that energy producers shouldn't be polluting unnecessarily and that we should put a price on carbon to create an efficient market for energy and not have future generations pay that price. So that's a good example where it actually takes a policy shift to ensure that the market is operating efficiently. Another example is taxation. Investors need to be taxed to ensure that we're building roads and bridges and the internet and educating. Mm -hmm. And so these things that are important for the common good and for society and markets to succeed are being properly invested in. How would you look at education? Education is a great example where it can benefit from some market forces, but at its root is something that society decides together what to do about it and how to value it. Yeah. So we can't pretend just to let education go to market forces because it, it works on too long of a time horizon and it benefits so many people when people are properly educated. And to create real economic opportunity that's equal, we also need to invest in education. And that has a positive benefit for the whole economy. So again, it's like the foundation for a house. You need to keep tending to these things and not just assume that they're there. So you have to keep ensuring, checking your foundation, keep repairing it, keep renewing it to ensure that your house is in good condition and in a position to weather the storm. Like you and your daughters are doing with your garden, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> I got to teach them how to check foundations as well. <laughs> I want to stick with public policy for a second, Ian. What policies could help create an environment for impact investing and private capital for good? What are some of the changes you would like to see? Proper investment in renewables, not just in terms of a carbon tax, but R&D, as well as implementation of solutions, upgrading building standards and providing funding to upgrade building standards, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much to do in clean energy that is going to be great for the economy and great for racial justice and equity in our country and countries around the world. It's just a win-win-win and it's time to double down in doing that. Mm -hmm. Proper taxation is important to create opportunities for investing in things like education. When you have a well-educated workforce, it means that you're much able, more able to start great businesses of all kinds. Yeah. And one of the successes of the United States is investment in high school education a hundred years ago, and then in higher education going back a hundred years as well. It's time for us to renew that commitment and ensure true equity of opportunity education to ensure we have a strong economy and also because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And I know these are climate changes on the top of mind for you as well. What are some of the things you're doing in that arena with your portfolio? Just one thing to follow up on your previous question, there's just sort of hot off the press released a new report exactly on this, on what U.S. policy could help to promote impact investing. And so the U.S. Alliance for Impact Investing is just releasing that report just very recently, authored by, I think, a previous guest on this, Fran Siegel. Yeah. Um, so in terms of climate change, when we started to build out the Blue Haven portfolio, we were really looking at, we've got a large portfolio, we've got lots of asset classes, we want to be diversified, not just in terms of asset class, but also in terms of industries and themes and sectors that we touch. And so 
when we started to build the portfolio, we didn't have an explicit focus on climate change. But over the years, what we have found is that both just because there are great opportunities in the space, diversified across the globe and in lots of asset classes. When we look at our portfolio diversification, we have a lot of climate change investments. And so starting about three years ago, we were like, you know what, let's lean into that a little bit further. And so what that has looked like for us is, yes, we have participated in some kind of innovation plays that often seems to be where people go to on kind of climate tech, clean tech VC, which we think is exciting. And we have supported a number of early stage innovation plays, third derivative out of Rocky Mountain Institute, Prime Coalition is another one that we've been supporting for a long time. They look at sort of hard tech, clean tech solutions, which are not as sexy as a you know, SaaS play in climate tech, but probably are going to have a bigger impact. So we have done some of that, but where we're really, really looking is where are there more opportunities for next generation climate innovation project finance? We're big fans of private credit and infrastructure. Generally speaking, we like that as a family office. And so, you know, after you have funded the innovation and you actually need to then build a plant that nobody really knows how to finance yet for this new technology, no one's exactly sure what the offtake agreement is going to look like. That's where we're particularly leaning in now and looking at a couple of different opportunities there. But we also think it's a fun place for family offices to play because we do have slightly more flexible capital. Yeah. We can do things that look a little bit strange and are oddly sized for other kinds of investors. So that's where we're looking at now, sort of on the deployment side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Liesl, how do you think about your philanthropy? and your concessionary investments in the context of your overall strategy and impact? So we really do, I'd say, start with our day job is as investors and try to be as thoughtful as we can on the investment side. So to me, I see our philanthropy as the liquid that fills in the gaps. Um, and that's so, a nice metaphor. I like that. <laughs> that's always how I think about it. It's like we're building the structures of this portfolio and then there are gaps and things that don't connect. And that's where kind of the philanthropy can come in. A lot of our philanthropy is actually around sort of like eco, <laughs> to use the liquid metaphor again, plumbing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you connect things together and get information flowing between two silos? And so that is also a little bit tricky to quantify, but that's often what we play. So lots of networks, how do we get other investors involved? How do we talk across different silos and gather power together is where I'd say we spend some time in our philanthropy. Anything in your philanthropy in particular during this pandemic that you've been doing, Liesl? This has been a really, really interesting moment, but on the pandemic side, there have been a number of different and interesting funds that have popped up in relation to COVID and funding things like that. And we have funded a few of those. There's one called Open Road Alliance Fund, which right. um, they're does, great. they're terrific. Um, they were made for this moment. That's exactly right. So what we basically tried to do was look for organizations that were made for this moment and fund them. So Open Road Alliance, for those that don't know, is a fund that provides bridge loans to companies who are in a moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. not, not like the business is tanking because it's a bad business, but there has been an event and they're very good at identifying a good use case for the type of bridge loan that they offer. And they've been doing this for years. And so... They work with high impact companies that just need this little band aid for a minute in order to live on forever. So we funded them. And then the other thing that we funded as we were looking around for great opportunities was Give Directly. Great organization. Such a, I've been a big fan of theirs for a long time. And so they do unconditional cash transfers. They do it in a highly efficient way using technology, but also what they're extremely good at is identifying and finding families who just, just need a little cash. And so we partnered with them to do a program in the U.S. as well as in Kenya 
because again, with something like COVID, you're looking around for all these clever, interesting investment things. And at the end of the day, we looked at each other and we were like, maybe we just give people money. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the most we were talking earlier about randomized control trials. One of the things that Give Directly is really militant about is measuring their impact. Yeah. Um, whatever intervention you're thinking of doing, whether it's training farmers on inputs or a water sanitation plan or things like that, is it better than just giving people cash? Because mm -hmm. sometimes giving people cash is the best option. Actually, a lot of the time it is. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, they so were on the show and I remember their president said that they look at giving cash as almost an index fund. Yes, exactly. And you can mark all the other international development and humanitarian organizations to get, can you do better than just giving cash? And that yeah. then becomes the index fund, which I thought was a wonderful way to describe it. Oh, it's so good. And the other part that I love about that is that it's also like wildly subversive and radical. It's saying to, you know, some, somebody fancy pants up at the UN who's been working <laughs> development all of their lives saying, actually, no, you should just be cutting checks. Yeah. And then get out of people's way. Don't teach a man to fish. Don't give him a fish. Give him money. Maybe he wants a lamb chop. Like, sure. it's not a, <laughs> you know, like, um, And so that was one of the things we did during this too, is just say, you know what? They already do this. Mm -hmm. Their intervention, the thing that they are the best at the world in, this is a perfect moment in time to give an infusion of cash to families that need it. And so let's just do that instead of trying to get too clever. Yeah, one of their most interesting studies I, I recall was that if you give people money, what they're going to do is they're going to go out and buy cigarettes and alcohol. And it turns out that consumption of both of them went down once they were given the money, which was completely counterintuitive to those fancy pants experts you were just talking to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ian, you both have said you believe there is a responsibility that comes with being a wealth holder. And particularly today, talk a little bit more about that, if you would. Well, one thing that's happened in the last 50 years in the United States is an extreme concentration of wealth, where the top 0.1% own pretty much the same about as the bottom 90% in this country. And with that wealth is not only financial security and ability to drive the investment climate, but also political power. Mm -hmm. You're in a position to advocate for policy and get together with other investors and business owners and help make that happen. And that concentration of economic power has in fact combined with a concentration of political power and meant that the rules of the game have become increasingly unfair for working families across this country. So there's a question of what do we do then? Do we throw up our hands and saying, hey, we're wealthy, therefore we shouldn't participate at all in politics or in advocating for change? Or are there ethical ways of trying to work together with people advocating for equity as well as our own ability to advocate for our own future generations and be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And so where we've come down on that is to ensure that as part of our family office approach, we really lean into policy and try to do that in a way that is ethical and proactive. So an example of that would be the wealth tax where that would directly affect us. We would pay more in taxes if a moderate wealth tax passed, say for example, of two or 3%. And the thing with a policy like that is it's already extremely popular. So it's actually, according to a polling through the last couple of years, and even more recently, in battleground Senate states, even in Mississippi and in Kentucky, the wealth tax is favored two to one. You know, it's, a, it's favored by a majority of Republicans. So it, where the political environment's out of sync is that the office holders in the Senate and the White House have been opposed to it, although notably Donald Trump came out in favor of a wealth tax about 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, but, right. But it's part of being part of the solution. is Yes, we do need more revenue to fund solutions that we know work. So many philanthropists have funded early childhood interventions, and we know they work. We know that doing pre-K is a good thing for the economy for the long term and ensuring more equitable outcomes. It should be scaled across the country. To pay for that, you can use debt financing, but over time you are going to, to actually pay for these things as well. And so having some increased revenue in form of wealth tax to pay for universal child care, to pay for universal broadband, these kinds of things that do require funding. So that's an area we thought, hey, majority of the population is already in favor. Economists think this is good for the long-term health of the country. 
Is it practical? So that's, I mean, that's the biggest criticism you hear is that it's not practical. How would you address that? Well, I think a lot of folks who say it's not practical haven't actually talked with bankers or insurance executives who uh -huh. analyze wealth <laughs> all the time. So, <laughs> you know, JP Morgan would be out of a job if they couldn't analyze someone's assets. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the insurance industry would be pretty much devastated by not being able to do any kind of assessment. And the IRS wouldn't clearly be able to account for people's estates. So we actually do measure wealth all the time. Yeah, uh, there yeah. are fine point details to work out about how you exactly would do it this way, but that's the part of the work that needs to be done. So we're helping fund some policy work to work out some of the kinks on this, but these are minor quibbles rather than a big strategic issue with the wealth tax. Yeah. yeah and I'd be curious, how do the two of you work together? Do you divide and conquer and break up interests or how, how does that all come down? Yeah, it really starts with our law, our approach that is intergenerational. We really do think in terms of how will future generations be affected by what we do? How do we create a better world for our children, but also family across the world? What are the little things we can do to improve things? And having that long view means that both of us share the importance of working on things that take a while, but to make a big difference. So the unsexy, persistent projects that if they pay off would have big benefit are really interesting to us. So that really helps. And then given that we both have an interest in, in practice and experience on the investment side and on the philanthropy side and on the policy side. So really in terms of the actual time we spend, sometimes it's a bit of a divide and conquer. So sometimes I'm spending more time on one piece of it and these are spending more time on another piece of it, but it's so much fun coming home to the dinner table at night and talking about what we've done that day, <laughs> and figuring out where we want to go next together. So it's been aligned together and then divide and conquer. No. Yeah, we don't come home to dinner anymore. We just change rooms. I know. Uh, pretty much, <laughs> pretty <laughs> much the, the way it is. So Lisa, what happens when you have a conflict? How about when you're not having a meeting of the minds? How do you resolve those? We're very lucky that we have built an incredible team around us. And Blue Haven is a, it's a really, really a team sport. It's not the Simmons family office. It's <laughs> Been built by anyone that's ever worked for us. And so I would say a huge part of it is also empowering our managing directors and our associates and our analysts to like, you guys tell us what we should be doing. We're not the smartest people in the room. You tell us our investment committees and we have advisors both on the philanthropic side as well. And so that helps a lot. So it's not just the two of us quibbling about oh, we should do this grant or that grant. So I would say putting some governance and some infrastructure in place really helps out. But for the most part, we're fairly aligned in our strategic vision. Ian is a lot more up to speed on the importance and, and role of government. I would say this is one thing that he's been working on his entire career, but the impact investing space, like what I always think is funny is so we're in the middle of SOCAP right now where mm -hmm. we'd be at multiple cocktail parties and for a few years, like, okay, yes, we're Blue Haven. Yes, we do investing. And then Ian would start to talk about his youth voting work, the tax policy work, why these things are really important. And, you know, you sort of get from the VC crowd, like, okay, all yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Um, that's okay. And then 2016 hit. And everyone was like, hang on, Ian, Ian, Ian. So wait, yeah. so <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about your stuff. Tell me why. And he's like, yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to go all of a sudden. Yeah. Well, actually, you can actually, these things, oh, are you saying that something that's happening in our political world is now an existential threat to your adorable climate plan? It's a big deal. And that, again, as he says, we need to keep building that foundation of democracy in order for any of these things to really take hold and flourish. And so I would say, though, we've over the last few years in particular, really leaned into that part of our work as a family office. And that's really led by Ian. I was much more, the private sector can do it all. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, I've really learned my lesson <laughs> over the last few years. So. No, I think a lot of people believe that impact investing in philanthropy can only be as effective as the ecosystem in which it is operating. And that is created by and large by the, the government. So Ian, being uh, the one having these conversations at SOCAP and other places, how can investors and leaders jumpstart constructive dialogues 
about the challenging issues of the day? Because that is the issue of the day. People can't talk to each other. What have you learned about that? What can we do to have some fruitful conversation without attacking one another? I think it's worth affirming some basic values that not everyone shares, but I think in these circles, many people do share that we should be aspiring for a society where everyone counts and mm. everyone has a, has a role to play and we're valuing everyone. And that works across multiple issues in climate, making sure that you know, communities, regardless of their economic status, have a future everywhere in the country, not just in places where we have relatives or where we work. And it also holds true for things like voting to ensure that everyone is able to show up and participate and encourage everyone to do that, regardless of their political affiliation. There is some work to do as a country to reestablish or renew our commitment to this, the idea of all of us in America counting and by extension, all of us in the world counting. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like five years ago, if I'd been talking that way, people might have been saying, hey, this is just a bit of stuff. But I think we've seen the importance of starting from the principle that we should be aspiring together to create a culture where we all count and where future generations count too. And that requires real work. So those are, starting from position of values is important. And then I think it does come to finding specific challenges where we can put those in practice. Climate's a great one. Political equality is a great one. We do a lot of work to try to encourage a culture where all young people are in, encouraged to step up as voters. And this isn't just a thing that government can write into policy. Oh, that's helpful. It's also a thing schools can do. So imagine a world where young people started voting at 16 in public high schools and were taught how to vote. And that was part of what you did at that age. And if colleges took it upon the responsibility to make sure all young people were showing up to vote who could, and didn't just see it as an extracurricular activity. So putting the democracy first and the foundations for democracy first, while also working on challenges like climate and education, I think is the way to go. It's a bit of a both and approach is what's needed now yeah, and will yeah. be needed for generations to come. Hopefully the lesson learned in the past several years is we cannot take their democracy for granted. So no matter what issue we work on philanthropically as our pet issue, whether it's environment or education or the arts, we should be doing something in our philanthropic and our civic work, and sometimes even in our investment work to strengthen democracy and work towards a more democratic society where we can solve all these problems better and faster. So that's one of the big, big lessons I hope is a takeaway is people should create a spot in their time and in their financial portfolio, no matter what other their specific issue is to also work on the fundamental or question of how we solve problems together and keep getting better at that. Um, Absolutely. Let me close with this for the both of you. You know, this set of crises has accelerated almost all fields. And I think developments that were taking five or 10 years, now we're seeing in maybe one or two. Do you think that's going to be true for impact investing? And if so, where do you believe those great advances are going to be? I'll start with you, Liesl. Yeah, I think that impact investing is, it's definitely very popular. ESG, you're seeing basically every financial institution has addressed impact investing or ESG in some way going forward. And so I think that's very promising. Where I think there can be some exciting work done is on disclosure, measurement, and getting those feedback loops to be shorter between investors and constituents or beneficiaries. And so how is your investment impacting the communities that it is serving? And how do we get that information quickly and reliably? That's where I would like to see it go. And again, with this pandemic and these issues around racial equity, where do you see it all going? I see more muscle needing to be built around creating stronger public-private partnerships to accelerate solutions. We've talked about climate a bunch, but another one that would matter in this area is education and another one that would matter is on the health side and another is yeah. on housing. So that mm -hmm. housing is way too expensive for most people in this country and yet is the foundation for a healthy family and a good society. And yes, there's a whole affordable housing tax credit structure, but the whole system really isn't working for most Americans. So yeah. there's uh, a lot of work to be done to structure public private partnerships to accelerate investment solutions and government solutions alongside philanthropic ones. Uh, Liesl, if any listeners should be interested in learning more about your strategy and approach, tell us a little bit about your website. 
Sure. Well, you can learn uh, more about us at www.bluehaveninitiative.com. Mm -hmm. You can follow us on Twitter or me and Ian on Twitter. I'm Liesl Pritzker and he's at I, I think underscore Simmons. Is that right? <laughs> and so that's how you can find us. Yeah. I'm just I Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll pick up a follower, Ian. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you, both of you, for being here today for a really interesting and enlightening conversation. It was just a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.